the survey. And uh, while you look at the survey, I'd like uh, to congratulate all of you who are still in the room for a long day, rich in content and discussion, but I'm sure that you agree that this was absolutely energizing, extremely uh, filling a lot of the elements for our future actions. So uh, a round of applause to all of you here in the room, to each of us. And uh, let's welcome the Indigenous Alliance uh, people represented and moderated by Diana Mastracci. Diana has been traveling across the globe to be here today, can I say so, <laughs> to be in time and being in this session together with uh, the fantastic representative from the Indigenous Alliance. Diana, the floor is yours and we're truly excited to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paola. Uh, this is really excited to be uh, I'm really excited to be here, and it's really an honor. This is the first Indigenous session at uh, ODOX, so I wanted to thank the organizing committee, and a special thank you to Paola De Salvo, uh, who made sure that we were all here. And uh, the integration of Indigenous knowledge into scientific frameworks is critical for ad addressing the biodiversity crisis and climate change. However, there's a significant data gap, uh, which is the voice and data of indigenous communities. And this gap not only hinders their capacity to monitor and manage local ecosystems, but also contributes to bias in models used in climate change. So it's really an honor for me to invite the first speaker here, Mario Vargas Chacaim, who came all the way from the Ecuadorian Amazon, uh, who will speak about the Tome Catip uh, project, um, indigenous uh, labeling for machine learning and AI. Mario Vargas. Mario? Here. And, and sorry, if I could ask the other speakers to take uh, the seat. We could have uh, Mario slides. Diana, muchas gracias. Creo que hasta que encuentre mi presentación una vez más, quiero hacerles llegar un saludo desde la selva. So once again, I mean, while we are waiting for the slides, he wanted to uh, give a warm welcome from the uh, jungle. También es un honor de compartir este panel con, con un compañero de Kenia, quienes hemos creado la Alianza Yendena. And it's also an honor to be here with, uh, with my colleague Titus de Tapo. Bueno, vamos a hablar sobre el proyecto Letom Catip que estamos viniendo implementando entre dos pueblos indígenas, Shuar y Samuru, y dos países entre Ecuador y Perú. Ah, perdón, y Kenia. So we're going to be talking about the Tome Catip project, which is taking place in two different countries, Kenya and Ecuador, and with two different indigenous uh, tribes, the Shuar Nation and the Samburu tribe. Voy a hablar un poco de la cuenca amazónica que está asentado los territorios pueblos indígenas en nueve países sudamericanos. I will just briefly talk to you about the Amazon Basin, which covers nine countries in Latin America. Esos países son Guyana Francesa, Surinam, Guyana, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Perú, Bolivia y Brasil. Uh, these countries are Bolivia, Guyana, Suriname, uh, French Guyana, Colombia, Ecuador, Brazil, Peru, and Bolivia. Habitamos 511 pueblos indígenas y también existen 66 Pueblos no contactados. 
There are 511 indigenous nations in the Amazon basin and as well 66 um, indigenous nations that are uh, uncontacted. Aproximadamente 2.5 millones de pueblos indígenas en toda la cuenca amazónica. Approximately about 2.5 million indigenous uh, people in the Amazon basin. En mi país es la región amazónica más pequeña como pueden ver en el mapa. Vengo de esta cuenca más pequeña de toda la región. As you can see, my country has the smallest portion of the Amazon basin, which is Ecuador. Aquí podemos ver que, hemos, que es posible trabajar entre dos pueblos. Pueden mirar en la bandera ecuatoriana y también la bandera de Kenia, a la cual nosotros estamos trabajando los dos pueblos indígenas. Here you can see that it's possible for different indigenous nations to work together. As you can see, the, uh, here are pictures from both uh, the Kenya fieldwork and Ecuadorian fieldwork. Inicialmente ha sido importante de reunirnos entre población, entre habitantes para concretar eh, la estrategia de trabajo y también para capacitarles a, a los jóvenes eh, en el manejo de nuevas tecnologías y también recibir los conocimientos de nuestros sabios y sabias. Uh, it was very important from the start to have community meetings as well as workshops to uh, provide the capacity for the uh, youth to use this technology and as well to integrate the knowledge from the indigenous elders in the project. Como también podemos ver en el logotipo, eh, el logotipo está es un círculo y el ratón muy pequeño y el elefante es grande. <laughs> si lo pueden mirar. You can look at the, our logo there. It's represented by an elephant and a mouse. Nosotros aquí podemos ver, ver que hemos hecho un mapeo de dónde se va a colocar los sensores para poder conocer qué tipo de rata es la que está presente en, en este proyecto. So as you can see, here is a map where we want to locate the uh, sensors for the project to better understand the behavior of the rats. Aquí vamos a, a presentar un resultado. Es ok. Tranquilo, no se asusten, por favor. Creo que estamos pisando, no en la selva. Uh, please don't worry, don't be scared. We are not in the jungle right now. <laughs> Quizás hemos escuchado, bueno, son los resultados de, del monitoreo y quisiera al culto público preguntarles si esta voz corresponde a la Amazonía o a África. ¿Cuántos piensan que es de la Amazonía? Pueden alzar la mano. How many of you think this sound came from the Amazon jungle? Please put your hand up. Sin miedo, alcen, por favor. Don't be scared, you can put your hand up. Ok, tienen cero. Ok, you have zero. <laughs> Mi compañero va a explicar. My, my colleague Titus will explain. Um, I think that, that is um, the first uh, uh, sound. Oh, 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 that is a leopard. And, and baboons responding to uh, the leopard. Um, and that is during the night. Uh, you'll find that uh, the leopard uh, in our place attack the baboons at night. And the male baboons make a lot of noise 
to scare the, the leopard away. And uh, those um, um, uh, audio mob uh, plays on the elephant corridors so that we will be uh, aware on what uh, the elephants uh, or the cows that we are releasing will be interacting uh, in the wild. So it is a leopard uh, and baboons at night. Gracias, Tito. Thank you, Titus. También vamos a mostrar la imagen obtenida con las cámaras trampas. Retorno. Eh. If we put the slide before. Retorno. No, no, no. Slides before. Yes. Thank you. 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 Thank And, and here again, we will ask Titus to uh, explain to us what is this, uh, what, what it is that you're seeing here. Yeah, um, those are stripped uh, hyena in a water point uh, where uh, also the rewilded uh, elephant calves are using. So it means also there is an interaction of uh, uh, predators. Uh, within uh, where the, the rewilded calves are. Uh, and this is one of uh, the camera, camera traps that has been placed uh, on, those, on those areas. Esto es lo que es en Kenia y quisiera que estén atentos a lo que viene es el trabajo de Ecuador. And that was from Kenya and I want you now to pay close attention to the next video. No. En este video, ¿cuántos de ustedes lograron ver a ni el, al ratón? En este video, ¿cuántos de ustedes were able to see the rat? No han estado atentos todos. So not all of you were paying attention. <laughs> Lo mismo aquí es trabajo de Kenia, un elefante. Here is a work in Kenya, that's an elephant that was captured. Eh, igual aquí es el monitoreo de Kenia. Eh, mi compañero va a explicarles Titus. And, and here is also the um, uh, Titus will explain this, the map that you're seeing. Titus? Um, so again, uh, we call uh, uh, elephants, um, 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 uh, putting the collars on the neck, and the collar uses a satellite, um, and uh, we track the elephant movement. And the purpose of that tracking is to enable us to understand where they are and if they are on stress. And also the satellite or the callers also uh, help us in reducing a human wildlife conflict because by knowing where the elephants are, then we'll be able to, uh, to inform the community so that maybe they avoid those areas. We also call uh, um, uh, uh, lions Um, and um, um, the predators, some of the predators, to ensure that maybe uh, we are able to advise the community on there they, where they are. And uh, so we are using a satellite uh, to collect the data and we connect them to uh, a control room and uh, also the herders, those people who look after livestock, um, also able to use, the, to use it to, uh, to, to reduce uh, predation and uh, human wildlife conflict. Aquí estamos manteniendo reunión con los sabios para entender lo que es nuestro ambiente y nuestra naturaleza, tanto como de Ecuador y también de Kenia. Here we are having meetings with our elders, both in Kenya and Ecuador, to better understand uh, our environment. Muchas gracias por la atención. Marquete. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mario. Now it's my honor to introduce you to, to Titus Letapo from uh, the Gen Indigenous Alliance and Sarara Foundation. Uh, Titus, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so thank you very much, Mario. And um, I'll uh, briefly uh, talk about um, uh, the work we are doing. Uh, he has already explained on that. And um, I'll just show you on, what, on some of the applications that we are trying to develop. Uh, uh, this is one uh, uh, of the slide and um, uh, as indigenous, uh, uh, indigenous community, sorry, indigenous people alliance was uh, established, established uh, in 2019 in Kampra um, with the main aim of uh, supporting indigenous communities uh, in terms of accessing data and also ensuring their voices are being heard uh, within uh, GEO and other, and other forums. Um, so maybe just uh, briefly about the Samburu tribe. We, we are located in northern part of uh, Kenya uh, and we are semi-nomadic. Uh, we live alongside uh, wildlife and uh, we, our main livelihood is uh, our livestock. Um, uh, 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 we keep them um, for, our, uh, for our livelihood. Um, as a community, we are also being faced by a lot of challenges. Uh, uh, some of them are uh, being uh, caused by uh, climate change. Um, if you look at uh, some of them, uh, we have drought. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, droughts are no longer predictable. And uh, also they are, they, they, they are long, uh, than they, they are longer than, than before. Um, we also have shrinking uh, rangeland. Uh, you'll find that uh, because of drought and climate change, um, grasslands are disappearing and uh, bushes are taking over uh, uh, grasslands. Um, and uh, as you know, um, livestock and wildlife, that's what they rely on. Um, so the challenge is uh, shrink the grassland. Then we also um, unpredictable weather patterns. Um, initially, uh, the community used to look at the stars uh, or observe the stars or even uh, life, uh, life, uh, wildlife behavior or movement. Uh, uh, or movement. But at the moment, uh, it, it's, no, it's not easy at the moment to even for the elders themselves to do uh, to predict what what comes next. Uh, then, lastly, uh, loss of wildlife uh, habitat and and regional degradation. Um, um, you find that um, development uh, and even settlement are encroaching into uh, uh, wildlife habitat, um, and this one now causes more human uh, human wildlife conflict. Um, some of the um, impact of climate change are to uh, not necessarily Samburu community alone, but uh, most of the indigenous uh, communities across the world. Uh, with us, we have human wildlife conflict. You have seen uh, even Mario mentioning about the rats. Uh, it doesn't mean that rats used not to be there. They used to be there, but uh, uh, because of uh, climate change, uh, they have uh, turned to be problems. Um, we have a tribal conflict over limited resources, uh, especially water point and, and grassland. Um, in the northern part of the country, Kenya, we live with other tribes, but you'll find that uh, during dry season, we, we, we converge in one particular zone in, uh, in search of uh, uh, pasture and water, and that this one, uh, in most cases, causes a, a conflict over a limited uh, resources. Uh, there's also increase in human, uh, in, increase in uh, uh, waterborne diseases like cholera. Um, as, um, sometimes also we share uh, the same water point with wildlife uh, and livestock. Um, water is not uh, maybe treated uh, when water is uh, very little. Uh, you'll find even uh, wildlife uh, falling into the wells and dying in, into that, and there's no other option, but the community has to use that water um, during a critical moment. Then we also have uh, economic losses uh, as a result of drought, um, livestock die, um, and that's uh, the main uh, 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 mainstream of our uh, meaning. Then um, as a result of all these challenges, um, as a community, we thought of uh, um, finding uh, solutions. And uh, uh, through the Indigenous Alliance, um, we, we conducted a, a NACADON uh, in trying to develop a, a solution. Uh, personally, I presented uh, the, the problem, uh, that this is a problem and this is what we intend to do, uh, developing uh, an application which is um, culturally relevant to, uh, to Samburu community that can assist them, um, possibly to identify what, where water points are, uh, or to, to, that will also guide them uh, on where a pasture uh, is, is still remaining. And again, 
by using um, uh, by using um, symbols. I know you know uh, combining three words, uh, but uh, with us, other than combining three words, uh, we we thought of uh, let's say present uh, using uh, symbols of our life and livestock, uh, which are well known to the uh, to the community. Uh, so the genesis of that uh, application, we started by with the hackathon, and we had a a winning team uh, um, for about uh, seventy people across across the continent, uh, and it was also during the uh, the pandemic. Uh, during COVID-19, where when movement was not uh, allowed, so the team uh, uh, worked remotely, and they develop uh, uh, the application um, without any funding, um, and um, uh, with the support of a uh, 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 space for innovation and uh, Joe Indigenous Alliance, we accessed uh, some funds uh, from Green uh, Accountability and. Uh, at the moment, we are able to uh, finalize uh, the app, uh, which is now um, uh, to us is nearing to a final a final stage. Um, um, uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the first column, those those, that's, that, those are the initial one, and those are the symbols of uh, of our life, where ladies and maybe let's say women who mostly are not us who are going to use the the app will combine the three uh, three symbols and they'll be able to know the location where they are. And again, uh, if you look at the lower part, uh, this is now nearly the final, the final stage. Um, uh, uh, women, we have included even voices, the voices of uh, um, somebody. If uh, you, you press a health uh, button, uh, let's say a clinic button, because we have mobile clinics, then women will be able to understand where the clinic is that day, so that if there's an emergency, then they will be able to, to go there. They will also, we also have mobile schools, um, and sometimes uh, uh, being a pastoral community, we keep moving from one point to another point. So if you press a, a school point, then you'll be able to know where the school has moved to. Um, and again, even markets. Um, also using satellites, uh, we'll be able to uh, locate where uh, remaining waters are, and also possibly using it uh, when it is uh, fully developed uh, to um, uh, even to, pr to predict whether rain will, uh, will come or not. Um, we, through the funding that we, uh, we got through uh, Green Accountability, we, did, we trained the women on the use of the app. They, they put their contribution on what the need is uh, or what need to be included within the application. Um, and also we trained the rangers. The same application will be used to monitor wildlife, uh, to reduce human wildlife conflict, and also um, the same application will be used um, uh, to map out degraded areas and to see the possible ways of uh, of uh, of um, um, uh, finalizing. So, sorry, the, the possibility of doing a range and rehabilitation. Um, the next steps on these uh, include the deployment of the mobile application to Google and Play Store, uh, so that uh, people will be able to access it. Um, then again, uh, uh, deploy. Um, um, the back backend uh, to secure cloud server. That one will also be done, uh, I think, within the next uh, one month uh, or so. Then uh, training on the final application so that women will be able uh, to know how to uh, make you women and everybody will be able to use uh, the application. Uh, make it easy. Make it easy as a, an indigenous alliance. We also make, want to make it easy to be adopted for by other. Other, other other indigenous communities across the world. Then uh, we also the next the other next step is also to fundraise to support the remaining steps of the of the app. Uh, so basically that's what uh, we do and uh, um, and as we are look, looking at the art intelligence for all, we are also making sure that the indigenous community uh, and other maybe uh, uh, unprivileged uh, people also are able to enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Titus. And it's now my honor to invite uh, Mohamed Omar from Geo Indigenous Alliance and Space for Innovation for uh, the next talk. Mohamed, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening. And, uh, my name is Mohamed Omar, uh, and it's a privilege to be here with you again. Uh, and in this 
uh, evening. So uh, I'm here to tell a story of uh, indigenous-led uh, climate action and education as part of the experiences for uh, Gaia for All uh, Indigenous Hackathon, which was held last year. So and, uh, the hackathon was a truly unique experience for, uh, for us, uh, for the team who worked on it. And for it, it, it allowed experts from all over the world uh, to come together and solve uh, challenges that were set by the community themselves. So and uh, this is the team uh, we were working together with. Uh, you can see the diversity in the team and also the representation of the youth. So my, and my team, the Samburu Water Warriors team, uh, we took up the challenge, uh, which was set by, by Titus uh, uh, from the Samburu community in Northern Kenya. And uh, the challenge focused on water scarcity and uh, challenges that are being exacerbated by climate change. So, uh, the Samburu, and um, I was supposed to give you a background and context about the Samburu community, but I think Titus has, has already said it, and I don't need to repeat it. So they are uh, semi nomadic uh, pastoralists who are who live in northern Kenya, and I added a location context map to uh, help people locate where the Samburu community are found in northern Kenya. So. And uh, through the through the challenge, we got to learn about the landscape and the and the and the climate of of uh, uh, the landscape and the lifestyle of the of the Samburu community. So uh, it's a very beautiful landscape. It has uh, um, uh, mountains and and, uh, and 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 riverbeds that come to life during the, 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 the rainy seasons. Uh, Northern Kenya has uh, two rainy seasons, March, April, May rainy season, which is considered the long rains, and uh, October, November, uh, rainy, October, November, December rainy season. So and, uh, they have a lot of, and, uh, the, throughout this landscape, there are a lot of streams and uh, that come to life only during the rainy season and they flash flood and they carry a lot of water so and uh, and uh, we tried to come up with a solution uh, that can solve the water scarcity challenges during the dry season so uh, the key questions that uh, we we uh, we were we were supposed to answer was where should the, the water conservation and, and, the, and the rainwater harvesting site, uh, sh where should they be located and how long uh, will they hold moisture? So we suggested uh, water storage through uh, sand dams, which can be set up during the dry season in these uh, dry river beds, which are, which are known as lagers, and, and they can be used to uh, conserve water during the rainy season, and then they can be used in the dry season uh, and and then it can reduce the the water scarcity challenges in the community so it has some pros and cons uh, the cons to this is it can effectively capture uh, a lot of water and it can store water after the floods and after the rain uh, season and uh, but there is an ups uh, there is a downside to it also they can be very expensive to build, and they require a lot of investments, especially in, uh, especially from uh, the community and the government itself. And there's a potential for these uh, for these uh, sand dams to uh, to worsen in uh, future and uh, floods. So our solution focused on 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 solving this on this uh, on this challenge. So we came up with two, um, two main, two main solutions, uh, which will, uh, which were the first one was GIS-based hydrological modeling that could help us locate where the the sites uh, can be located. So we used uh, a, in, uh, something called a, in uh, GIS-based criteria and uh, weighted criteria HP model 
that we, we analyze several factors such as land use, land cover, stream order, uh, population, uh, slope, so that we can find uh, the areas that are very, in, uh, that, uh, that have higher stream order, where a lot of water flows, and, and also where the, 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 the population can access them, and also in, uh, the slope it, in a, a water a, a storage point cannot be on a place that is very uh, very steep. It has to be somewhere on a, on the on the on the lower on the lower ground, and it, it does not have to be. It should it's not it should not be on the far end on on where all the uh, water and uh, can uh, can flow to. The second solution was. Uh, the, ex the, the monitoring of the existing sand dams so that we can know the, the amount of moisture that, that these in, uh, in, uh, sand dams are holding and, and how can we tell uh, the community to, and, uh, how can we know if, they, if these, if these in, uh, infrastructures are, are helping the community throughout the, the dry season. So the most important part of this activity was that uh, we have been talking about the integration of indigenous knowledge for the past two days and earth intelligence. So this was a good uh, model that integrated uh, both, these, uh, both these knowledges. We learned from the Samburu community, we learned uh, of their lifestyles, we learned of their landscape, and uh, we tried to figure out how can we use based on the knowledge that they have given us, how can we uh, and, uh, make a technology uh, uh, based in, uh, uh, solution based on the, on, the, on, the, on the knowledge that they have given us. So and it was also very an, uh, unique experience because we learned from Titus the, the grazing seasons the, and uh, the behavior of the livestock and during the year and and how 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 they move throughout the land in search of water and pasture and uh, for their livestock and, and so on so and and how to how they usually and uh, titus highlighted in uh, the the human wildlife conflicts that emerges from and uh, from when the wildlife and the and the human uh, the livestock meet at a, at, at, a, at a specific water point. So you can see climate change is really affecting uh, these uh, communities, in, uh, especially the indigenous communities. So in, in future, what we hope to do is to continue to work closely with the community and ensure any solutions that we develop uh, are closely tied to their needs and they will involve uh, their indigenous knowledge as a core driver for uh, a template of technology enabled solutions that can hold, uh, that can help solve key key climate change uh, challenges thank you Thank you so much, Mohammed, uh, Titus, and Maria for these enlightening presentations, which I think really embody uh, what Earth Intelligence for All means. And so it's a pleasure now to uh, start the discussion. I will have one small question uh, with each of the panelists, and then I will open it up for uh, all of you to ask questions. Um, so Titus, my question is, what are some lessons learned uh, on meaningful engagement through the uh, Namuniak app and the Tomeka Tea project uh, for the geo community. Uh, first of all, um, it, it is very important to know that um, uh, challenges facing indigenous communities are uh, uh, brought by climate change are uh, similar, um, either. Um, uh, drought or floods or um, um, disappearance of let's say uh, species of plants that are important to to the community. Um, so uh, what we have learned is that uh, it's it is possible to work uh, for indigenous communities or communities to work uh, together and also learn uh, learn from one another. The lessons that uh, the Samburu community learned from. Uh, 
Ecuador, which is, um, I'm not sure even the, the, the distance apart, um, is very, um, very big. We are learning a lot from, from them and also they are learning a lot from, from us. So there are no barriers between uh, communities. Uh, the other thing is that um, um, engagement or participation in developing uh, solutions, especially to communities or indigenous communities, uh, need to be participatory and um, making sure that uh, uh, the community participate in developing uh, development of those solutions and also uh, are taken through the whole process from uh, initiation to, let's say, implementation of the of the program or project. Thank you so much, Titus. Um, we really hoped to enable more indigenous-led projects uh, through the Indigenous Alliance. And uh, Mario, uh, the next question is for you. Uh, why is it important for indigenous communities to collect and label their own data for machine learning and AI? Why is it important that the communities indigenous uh, obtain their own data for intelligence artificial? Bueno, creo que esta experiencia del proyecto es nueva y fundamentalmente queremos que también los, a través de los conocimientos propios a futuro se pueda crear nuestra propia sistema de recolección de información para el tema de inteligencia artificial y también de esta forma queremos ser inclusivos incluyente frente a la comunidad internacional. Uh, so this has been a very new experience for us and fundamentally in the future we want through our own indigenous youth to create our own AI models uh, to be more uh, inclusive and to be able to provide data as well to the scientific community. Y también tenemos como reto para el próximo año, tenemos un compañero dentro del equipo que tiene conocimiento en sistema de eh, informático. Queremos crear nuestro propio mecanismo o aplicación para el tema de, del manejo de la inteligencia artificial y que eso pueda servir también para los pueblos indígenas, y porque en este momento no tenemos propios que son nuestras. Uh, so we have a, a team member from the Shuar Nation who is actually in, uh, a software engineer and uh, um, in next year he will be working on developing AI, AI models and also to make sure that uh, other indigenous communities can have access to it. Muchas gracias, Maria. Um, and my question to you, Mohamed, is uh, what has been the benefit of participating in the indigenous hackathon and what is the future of such events? Uh, thank you. Uh, the, uh, the benefit of uh, participating in uh, such an indigenous hackathon was, for me, it was uh, a learning experience. Uh, and uh, the way I, I used to do projects, I used to do it from uh, uh, an earth observation GIS uh, perspective. So it was uh, a really new experience to get to learn from the recipients of, uh, sometimes we don't meet the, the recipients of our work. So it was a really good experience to learn from them, to learn of their needs uh, and how to, and, uh, how, to uh, how to model our solutions based on their needs. And also I, I got to come here and present about the solution through the through the 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 indigenous hackathon, so I I got the opportunity to to learn and network. This is my first geo symposium and outdoor workshop, so uh, that that was a, a big thing for me. And also, can you repeat the next the, the second question? What what do you think are, is the future of such events like the indigenous hackathon? Yeah, I think. Uh, the past two days we have talked a lot about the, uh, the about the integration of indigenous knowledge and earth intelligence and uh, moving from vision to and, uh, to to impact to action. So I think uh, the geo, the indigenous hackathon has uh, has set the uh, the ball in motion. Uh, they have already 
and uh, demonstrated how uh, these two knowledges can be uh, integrated. And I think uh, GEO should lean uh, uh, forward and continue supporting such initiatives like this and, 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 uh, and, and uh, see the change in, and, and the impact that, it, that they, they envision to see. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. And now it's a pleasure to open up the floor if uh, any of you have uh, questions. Thank you so much once again for being with us. Uh, please put your hand up if you have a question and uh, say your name and your organization and to who the question is uh, directed to. Thanks, it's Andy Mellett from the GS Secretariat. I'm just picking up on your point about wanting to see more indigenous-led projects. How would you like to see that happen? And that's to any of the panel. Um, I hope I, I got your question right. How um, we want maybe um, the 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 communities to be engaged? It was you no. Know, how how do you want to see more um, indigenous-led projects? So what do we need to do as Geo to help that? Um, I um, I think number one is supporting um, the ongoing projects. And uh, to to be finalized, um, then again, uh, looking at uh, the community needs. Um, so what you need, uh, what we need from Geo is funding, um, and again also capacity building uh, in areas that we feel this this need. Excellent, thank you. Thank you all, that was a great session. I really appreciate learning more about the applications and the research involved. Um, Justine Anichinska from NOAA. Uh, my question is kind of a follow on to Andy's, but really looking at the future GEO work program and the work, there's certainly a lot of synergies and opportunities I'm seeing here between other work program activities and the work you do. How can we ensure that we kind of integrate a kind of participation throughout other activities better engage indigenous peoples in throughout the work of GEO, uh, learn from your experience here. Uh, and part two of that question is really the work you do with the GEO Indigenous Alliance. If there are other people, indigenous groups who want to join, how can they get engaged and learn more about the work that you do? Thank you so much. Um, um, the, the, the Alliance is growing. Um, and uh, we we are continuously engaging uh, indigenous communities across uh, across the globe. Uh, though uh, funding limitation, we still have a funding limitation. And I think um, um, through uh, with Geo, we are the entry point at the moment to reach out to uh, those uh, those communities. We have the capacity to to do that uh, if uh, we have funding uh, to do that. But. Uh, Communities that are that are willing to join us, uh, they are always welcome. Um, and uh, we have already we have developed uh, principles. I think they are already available on uh, what is needed uh, uh, to join. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there are also those principles uh, within the Geo Geo website. I think or not yet there. Yeah. So through the website, uh, even Geo website, you are able to access and know how to uh, to join. Um, I got it before you, Marie Francoise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for this um, incredibly exciting uh, project that you have developed and, and executed. Now to the question, I, I very much appreciate and I know that you need the resources to engage more. This is uh, what we have been discussing uh, over a, quite some time now. Um, what I know about funding is that uh, it's actually very good to have a project to as a starting point. So attending meetings is not like that. It's not, you know, you ne need to have a project. So I would say that with the projects that you have, you have some very good examples 
I mean, I was excited to hear about it and very surprised. So I think that is something that you can build on. And now, so the second point I want to make is that, so how can we, hmm, how can we turn that into um, using the data, data and knowledge uh, working group? Because we really want your expertise and engagement in the further development of the of the principles, the management principles, and the open knowledge. You know, turning the open knowledge statement into knowledge principles. We really want to engage you with that. So, if you. It, on the top of your head now, this is really fast thinking for you to do now, but if you can think of something um, where data, where where how you handle the data could be part of a continuation of what the, of the project that you already are engaged in. I think that, that if you have some ideas on that, we would be very happy to hear that in, in the, the Geodata working group and um, yeah, so some ideas on the top of your head, so we can uh, take that further. That would be great. Um, for the Tomekati project, which Titus uh, and Mario talked about, the data will uh, will be open uh, source for everyone available. So that's something as well that we can talk about how to include that data in the Open Knowledge Hub. Well, I'm in the same uh, mode of thinking as Bent uh, to see how the data working group can interact with you. If you will keep the data in your own, uh, in some repositories where you want to um, archive it for a longer time, I mean, to check climate change impacts maybe. But in this case, how can we maybe uh, work to see how we can interact respecting your sovereignty and all the care principles I think it could be interesting to have a use case of uh, these data. Do you provide them to the Data Hub or do you want to keep them where you are? And then in this case, how would we implement these uh, care principles uh, and, and the sovereignty you have to keep on your knowledge and your data? Uh, this is something I think that would be interesting to think about. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, we are open on that, and um, 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 we can we can talk. So that that's fine uh, because um, the data is not only for for us alone, but uh, all all of us. So it's uh, open. Okay. But I I mean that for instance, uh, we have had this presentation about uh, licenses. Even if you want your data to be open, they can be some credit that can be to each community or to the indigenous alliance. I mean, there are some things like that that can be already um, defined maybe. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, it's, it's a, a great pleasure to see uh, you representing the communities. Uh, I have a couple of points to, to suggest perhaps. Because when we talk about climate change, these indigenous communities are the ones that are suffering most, and but they are also the ones that are going to be protecting the environment, whether it is in the Congo Basin, whether it is in the Amazon, whether it is in the areas where you have the wildlife that uh, are, are, are not going to be there. So what I would suggest is, if this is the case, and it is the case, how can we make a case for the loss and damage funds that the UN and the world is working on because these are the communities that are paying for the, for the climate uh, problems. So I would, I would suggest let's work together to really look at how these communities could access the loss and damage uh, funds. Yeah. Um, uh, 100% we agree on that. And um, I think uh, we have also used uh, uh, geo forums, uh, for example, when we are in South Africa and also in Ghana uh, to meet with uh, ministers. Um, and I remember also we met with the Congo uh, uh, delegation uh, just to try to make sure that maybe even uh, indigenous communities uh, in those countries are uh, looked upon and uh, not forget forgotten. So. 
um, we appreciate even the presence uh, that uh, GEO has given us because uh, it's an opportunity also for us to interact uh, with uh, government officials and we have already done that. Uh, anytime that we get an opportunity, uh, we try to meet with the uh, uh, government officials uh, in this forum. So I think um, we are trying to do that and also um, um, trying to look uh, for support and funding from other, other, other avenues. So thank you for that advice. Uh, thank you for, for highlighting uh, those uh, opportunities, especially in terms of resources. And something to highlight on uh, will be when you say the indigenous communities are being affected, uh, they, they are bearing the brunt of climate change. You need to convince people to, uh, to uh, you need to show them uh, how, how they are being affected. So earth, earth intelligence uh, data is really important when, when they are making their case so you can visualize the, uh, the changes uh, in climate uh, by using the rainfall data and, 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 and the other types of EU data that's available and uh, make your case. So I think uh, it will be good to also explore and, uh, how to make uh, uh, that, how to support that case in, uh, and, and, and that in uh, and uh, storyline uh, by using an uh, EU uh, data. Hi, Mark Erringer from uh, HealthSites.io. Um, I just wanted to um, reinforce the two points that our colleagues have mentioned in terms of the loss and damage and the project um, approach. So I, I agree with both of those. And, and you know, we were talking about such an important thing in terms of funding. Everyone has got that funding challenged. And um, I think making the business case for the cost of not acting and not doing what you're doing in a, in a succinct way that can be quantified, and then taking a project, <laughs> establishing a, um, a project scope and time and cost, and then using those two elements to uh, support other communities to say, look, if you want to run our campaign, it costs $20,000, and these are the activities that you do, and, and this is the business case that you can make to the National Statistics Office or the, you know, the environmental um, uh, department or um, whichever ministries that you're involved with. So I think, you know, as, as a community, we really do need to come together uh, around the business case approach and to quantify climate change impact. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. We, uh, we look forward to discussing with you this uh, more after the talk. Uh, Paula? Yes. Um, thank you very much. Beautiful session and very rich content and that's where I get uh, not worried but uh, thinking of how are you preserving all this uh, content how are you preserving all the different uh, examples different cases should could this is an offer and uh, up to you to take it and uh, I see the potential in the geo knowledge app to create a community space for the indigenous alliance where to start storing everything you are sharing in the form you want we can have videos we can have software code uh, publication uh, training so if this is useful for you we'll be super excited to support as part of the engagement with you and as part of support so um, at your service Um, yeah, that is um, already a good start, and um, we are so proud on that. And uh, if you can help us on that, um, we'll highly appreciate um, so that even other uh, other communities can also see it. And um, um, yeah, and um, 
for example, as I said earlier, the applications or anything that we are developing, um, it can be adapted by any, any community, uh, wherever they are. Uh, as long as it can also assist them in solving their their, their problems, and also um, sharing knowledge, um, especially even some of them can also still contribute into into the those applications uh, for better. So we'll highly that one is highly appreciated. Thank you so much. We might have question. We won't, might have time for one more question. Uh, if there is anybody else interested. Okay, then I think this is uh, a wrap up. Thank you so much once again for all your input. And if you're Thank interested you. in working with the Gen Indigenous Alliance, please, uh, uh, we are here for that. So we look forward to collaborating. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you all for staying here. Such a long day, so engaged, and uh, it was uh, fantastic. We are now being informed that for those of you who are willing to have dinner, there is dinner offered at, uh, around the reception area. And uh, for the working groups, there is dinner in the restaurant of the Manju Hotel. Um, and also let me remind you that tomorrow we have another full day. Uh, still, keep going, being engaged. We will tackle how open data and open knowledge will be essential for the focus areas, for agriculture and food security, for water and land, for weather and disaster, ecosystem biodiversity and carbon, climate energy and urban, and One Health. So be, continue to be engaged and we look forward to a very exciting second day tomorrow for the open data, open knowledge. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you.